Hello and welcome to Quarren Con 2021 um, with our writing panel at Writing uh, Fight Scenes. Um, my name is Damien. I'm here with a host of uh, all sorts of different uh, writers from right across the board in terms of experience, in terms of genres. And we're going to have a fantastic conversation today about how to write and craft the perfect right, uh, fight scene. Now, before I, uh, we dive into it and we go into introductions, I do want to give a massive shout out to the entire team in Quarren Con. Um, so uh, there's been some fantastic fantastic work from the volunteers, from people who've uh, worked behind the scenes to uh, provide tech support to schedule all these different events. So I think um, let's take a moment just to say massive thank you for all the hard work that, that, that they've done. And um, obviously this is only day three of the event and there's still a few more days to go. So please keep supporting on social media. Um, I would also like to call to everyone's attention um, that there that there's an artist alley. So do check out um, the different books. I think there's a sale going on now for, um, I think supports of 40 different books that are at reduced rate so do have a quick look at that so just to kick off uh, i'm your moderator for this panel my name is damien larkin i'm an irish science fiction author uh, i'm the author of uh, big red that was my debut novel came out in 2019 and the second book in the series blood red sand is coming out in july of this year i primarily i primarily write uh, military science fiction uh, i spent seven years in the irish reserve defense forces and ended up as a weapon specialist um, I'm also co-founder of the British and Irish writing community. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. Now I'm going to just go around the table. Uh, if I can ask everyone here just to have uh, give a brief introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. So we're going to start with yourself, Susanna. Take it away. Hi, um, I'm Susanna Roundtree. I'm a Spiffbo uh, finalist this year um, with A Wind from the Wilderness, which is a historical fantasy set during the First Crusade. And it's the first in a nine book series. Um, so... As part of writing that series, I've had to do a fair bit of uh, research into medieval battle tactics and um, uh, medieval surgery and things like that. So that's kind of my angle that I'm coming to this panel from. I've written a lot of um, historical um, battle scenes um, with my own characters, and I'm really excited to be uh, talking about some fight scenes today. So. That's me. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you very much, Susanna. And uh, we'll go to yourself next, Michael. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Michael Bailey. Uh, not to be confused with the horror writer, Michael Bailey. There's actually two of us <laughs> out here. Um, I've been a working writer for 22 plus years now. I'm currently the author of the Action Figures Young Adult Superhero Series, the Humorous Fantasy Series, The Adventures of Strongarm and Lightfoot, uh, Well-Behaved Women, which is an urban fantasy trilogy, and relevant experience. I've been a stage combat performer for almost 20 years now, and I'm the fight director for the Connecticut Renaissance Fair. Oh, well, that's, that's really cool. Uh, Angela, if you, want to, uh, if you want to go next, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Hey, um, I, am, I was a uh, Spiffo 5 finalist with my book, Fortune's Fool, so that was the one before this one. Um, I, it's a kind of a twisty Renaissance inspired epic fantasy. Um, and I don't have any like relevant experience, I guess. I just watch <laughs> a lot of YouTube videos and do a lot of reading, but I did, it does have quite a few fight scenes in that. And it was really interesting because I did have to research both swords and like the early guns and cannons and um cool. things like that in order to write the book because both of those are in it very cool uh Stu, if you'd like to take it next tell us a little bit about yourself and your writing yeah sure uh so hi everyone i'm Stu hopston uh i write uh, kind of across the board mainly trad published uh, my last novel uh was tangles game published by rebellion uh that was a science fiction thriller although it was, it's more of a political thriller um uh, in terms of relevant experience I am an avid fencer. Uh, I teach and instruct and I compete for the UK. Um, uh, particularly, uh, I train particularly in medieval weapons, uh, Italian style, uh, 15th, 16th century. So I fight with rapier, rapier dagger, side sword, spadoni, uh, and a bunch of other stuff like that. Uh, in, like rapier and cloak, for instance, although there are no competitions where you fight with that. Uh, it's just a, sort of, a bit of a sideshow. If you come out of the pub a bit too drunk and someone accosts you, uh, you have a cloak <laughs> on you and you go for it. Um, so, and I, I'm an, also an avid LARPer, so, and I, I kind of help run a system here in the UK where we have big battles with kind of six, seven, eight hundred people at a time. Brilliant. That's, that's really cool. And uh, Andrea, if you want to take it away, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Yeah, sure. So I write epic fantasy. Um, my debut novel, The Bone Shard Daughter, came out with Orbit in 2020. And that's part of a trilogy. The second book, um, The Bone Shard Emperor, is coming out in November. Uh, as for relevant experience, I have minimal fencing experience. And <laughs> uh, I just... Um, I mean, I've done research, obviously. Uh, obviously, though, you can't do research on magic. So a lot of my fight scenes do involve magic. Um, so that, for me, just involves a lot of thinking. <laughs> you... And drawing maps of the area. Of course. <laughs> that was what I'd say. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Uh, look, we have everybody there. So uh, I reckon we should dive straight into it. So the first question of the night we have is, how, uh, how do you write a, a realistic fight scene? What tips or techniques would you use as a writer to ensure realism in a fight scene? Uh, would you take creative liberties for the sake of entertain, uh, entertainment value? Would that add or detract <coughs> from the reader experience? So how to write a realistic fight scene? Does anyone want to dive in? Um, I'll, I'll be the, yep. the sacrificial lamb for the first, <laughs> um, at least my personal philosophy with writing fight scenes is I, my, my approach is, uh, stylist is stylistic in form, realistic in function. Um, anyone who's ever seen a real fight knows that they're chaotic, sloppy, hectic, and honestly not very exciting. Uh, but trying to translate that into any kind of story, it's, it's not only difficult, you end up with, I think, an unexciting fight. So I'm, I'm all for taking artistic liberties when it comes to presentation, having the fights more, a little more Hollywood, for lack of a better term. And I think where the trade-off is making the, the consequences of the violence realistic. I'm, I'm at the point where I cannot, I cannot stop myself from getting angry at a movie or TV show where someone gets punched in the nose and all they do is say, ow, blink a few times, do this to make sure there's no blood and there almost yeah. never is, and off they go. And no, that's, that's not what happens when you get punched in the nose. Um, so I'm, I'm, try I'm personally mindful of what happens when you actually get hit by a fist or a foot or a weapon. And... I think that what that covers for the fact that your presentation is complete BS. It's a it's a fancy smokescreen. If you throw in realistic consequences, it, you'll get a pass on the fact that the form is full of artistic license. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some some interesting points there. Um, and would anyone else like to weigh in on that? Well, yeah, I like um. I, going off what Michael was saying about consequences, that really helps make the action feel grounded to me when I, as, a, as an audience. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Um, when, when, I'm, when I'm writing a fight scene, if it's a, if it's a sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing, um, I, I guess like a lot of the people here, I'll be on YouTube watching, you know, HEMA videos, historical European martial arts videos, um, I was, I've been working on a series recently um, where the main character knows some jujitsu and um, I was very grateful to my fellow Spiffo finalist, Alexander Darwin, who wrote this martial arts um, novel, The Combat Codes. And so that, that gave me the correct terminology to search on YouTube for this right. particular martial arts form. And for battles, um, I would just say, yeah, make sure you're researching if, if you're uh, – if your fantasy world is grounded in some real world analog or some real world period, it's really great to re research that period and, and those mi military tactics that were being used so that you know how the, you, you've got a foundation for how the battles would work and then you can build your world building and magical stuff on top of that. Yeah, very cool. So uh, in terms of like, um, like when you when you talk about writing an action scene or any type of fighting scene, what tips would you, uh, or and I'm going to open this up to everybody, what tips would you have for a writer starting off um, to, yeah, I suppose any pitfalls or mistakes you want to avoid in, in trying to keep the scene kind of realistic or what, what could add to it in terms of adding layers? So uh, I don't know, Angela, would you like to hop in or Stu or um, anybody? Sure. Um, well, just like what everybody has said with the consequences and, and um, it's the, I think 
like the important part is it's easy to get hung up on trying to get the choreography right you know like putting everybody in the right place and having the things happen in that that's important right because if you get it wrong that's bad but it's I think that you can focus on that to the extent that you like ignore the emotions or the sensations and those are equally important you know like you've that that gives you that atmosphere of you know, being afraid or being, um, you know, kind of excited or angry or, or whatever that character is feeling at the time. And, and those things mixed in with the actual actions of the scene yeah. are what give the scene its, its flavor. That's what sticks in your mind and like keeps you reading. In my yeah, opinion. very true. Yeah. I, th- I think for me, um, I think it's, it's good to remember that technically most people don't have a clue. <laughs> if, you, if you think if you think of the one movie where actual uh, kind of historical treatises and their masters are mentioned, the Princess Bride, nobody knows who those people are, and nobody <laughs> knows what they were talking about, and nobody actually knows that it's all an, the references there are nonsensical. But what they do remember is that that's a very those are very quotable lines in a very quotable scene, and it lends it some sense of it just it lends it a sense of immersion. And people yeah. really fall into it. And there's no, it's not too detailed. It's, it's a lovely little call out that feels plausible and builds the world. But none of it, you know, you, you don't need to go into them. Then their right foot went here and then their hand went like that. Unless, you know, unless, unless it's absolutely what you're trying to describe. There's no real need to do that, in my view. I think it slows you down in what should be something that's pacey and hard hitting and, and kind of leaves you feeling like, wow, I'm breathless. And, yep. so, and actually, actually describing the three parts of the play uh, to, to deliver the point of the sword into someone or, or whatever it might be just doesn't, it, it, I don't think it's really necessary most of the time. Uh, so I think, I think for me, the realism is, is, is in delivering something that people feel like, actually, I, I, can, I, I can see this or I can, I can understand it in my mind and, and I want, I, I'm invested. And that's, that's kind of what pulls you through. So I think there needs to be enough enough there that people feel like it all feels realistic so people shouldn't be walking through closed doors right but they (laughs) but but whether if they're all in the room do you really need to describe how they come around the sofa probably not and if you are you you probably worry you need to worry more about your pacing than you do about uh, whether or not you've you've kind of delivered the the sense of the fight in the right way i think yeah that's that's a brilliant way way of looking at i suppose it's it's almost like walking a fine line where you you kind of want to you know i suppose comment on the action but like you said you don't want to describe every single kind of facet of it or you know every like i mean you you wouldn't if you were describing a character walking across a a hallway you wouldn't say he he took a left step or a step with his left foot and with his right foot and so forth so andrea would you have any kind of tips in in terms of that is there anything that you would do specifically to your writing to i suppose enhance a kind of writing scene without i suppose while walking that fine line in terms of not going yeah. into too much detail and so forth? I mean, um, I have definitely done the thing where I kind of summarize a little bit about what's happening um, instead of going blow by blow. I think that uh, especially when you take into consideration that people are not usually reading for a blow by blow account, they're true, you know, more involved in the emotions of the scene and what's at stake uh, during the scene. Um, And in addition to that, I mean, just like small tips, I think keeping in mind the environment that they're fighting in is really important. Like, are they in an enclosed hallway? Are they outside in the rain? How does that affect um, the fight? Are they using elements around them uh, during the fight? Um, And uh, another thing (laughs) that I am very guilty of is um, not being clear about uh, where people are positioned, especially during a big battle scene. Um, So I've often gone back and kind of drawn a little map about like, oh, well, this is, you know, where these people are and this is where these people are. Um, And it's not like I'm going and describing in detail where they are at every moment during the fight, but um, using that as a reference allows me to kind of visualize a little bit more where people are so that readers don't feel lost when they're reading it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, brilliant. If I, Sorry, go on. If, if I could jump in, like one of the things that I've I've noticed from the very beginning, like we we have this idea when we think of fight scenes, we think of Hollywood, right? Action movies. But we're actually we're actually um, using a completely different art form. We're writers 
And I think a, a pitfall some people can fall into is they, they, um, they're trying to convey all the information that you would get in a Hollywood action movie. Um, but we, we actually have to come at it from a totally different um, perspective. And like the, a visual medium can, do, can convey all the visual detail. Um, but as writers, we have the we don't have that capacity. What we do have is the ability to go deep into what the character into the characters' minds and what they are thinking and what they are feeling. And so that is the kind of the area where we make the most impact, I reckon. Yeah, that's that's a great insight. Um, I had some fantastic points raised up there. Uh, Andrea, in particular, I think uh, when you mentioned about the, the environment and something that I, I think sometimes um, we can forget about uh, in terms of kind of writing scenes. Um, I know there's certainly many a time where it'll be maybe the eighth or the ninth kind of draft of, of a story or, or a scene where I actually go back and kind of add an additional layer to it. So, uh, yeah, some fantastic points there uh, from everyone. Um, so, look, we'll move on to the next uh, question, which is what makes a gripping fight scene? So, specifically, what makes a gripping fight sequence what do we as writers do to build um say tension in terms of like an epic showdown between like the hero and and, and his, his adversary um and how do you keep the reader in the moment without taking away from the overall story so i suppose that's more kind of like in terms of pacing but uh would anyone like to dive into that one or will i pick someone oh, okay um <laughs> no Stu, you guy i went first last time Thanks, Michael. Um, <laughs> I guess for me, I think we've touched on it a little bit already, but it's about the stakes, yep. right? Everything else, whether it's personal fight or whether we, something we didn't talk about in answer to the previous question about whether it's armies clashing, right? Whether it's an epic battle for the, for the life of a nation. Either way, it's all about the stakes. If you come into a fight and you and, and I, and I, or, or I come across a fight and I feel like I, I don't understand why they're fighting or, or even... Oh, you know, one side, it just doesn't feel like the stakes are high or, and the consequences will be high. You kind of you can breeze through it. It's a bit like an A-team fight, right? Everybody gets out of the car at the end. They shake their heads and then they wander off down the street entirely unharmed. And no, you know, no, no reality was harmed in the making of this show. Right? So you gotta, I, feel like, I feel like if I come into the fight understanding why this is taking place, then actually whatever happens in the fight, whether it's grand magic, whether it's lots of armies or whether it's just two people kind of having at it, that for me will carry me through because it doesn't really matter what they get up to in some senses in that conflict because I, all I, what I really want to understand is what comes out the other end. Yeah, that's very good. And uh, Michael, do you want to hop in there? Uh, yeah, kind of building a little bit off of uh, what Stu just said. Uh my over my overriding philosophy is uh, fight scenes need to have need to have a story all their own. They're not just a series of cool moves. It's not just two people slapping the crap out of each other trying to see who can make each other dead first. It has to have its own its own story, its own arc. And I, I went down a rabbit hole one day when I was bored. Bored during the pandemic, who who could have seen that? <laughs> shock, shock, horror. Um, and just really broke it, broke it down what goes into the story of a fight. And it covers so many bases from the stakes, which I think are among the most important element to, uh, as Andrea is saying, the environment. But there are all kinds of elements. There are elements of character. There are elements of the overall setting of the story. There's the immediate circumstances. And it, it's it's a lot to take in, and you can can overwrite to a degree if you let yourself. But if you give the fight a great story, I think it's very engaging. And the one example I love to point out is from the movie Troy. Uh, the movie itself, mm, hit or miss. And I know everyone likes to talk about the Brad Pitt Eric Bana fight, which is very flashy and cool. I love the fight between Orlando Bloom and Brendan Gleeson earlier on the fight because it is a beautiful storytelling fight. It captures elements of the overriding stakes being the Trojan War. It captures the immediate circumstance of the cuckolded husband fighting to get his honor back against the little snot who stole his wife. Brendan Gleeson, the older experienced warrior who's just 
250 pounds of straight ahead versus Orlando Bloom, who is terrified he's going to die. You want, you can find the video on YouTube, watch it. It is a beautiful example of telling a story with a fight. Cause you can see all the elements in playing that. Yeah, that's good. I haven't seen that film in years now. I do, I do kind of vaguely remember that scene that you kind of mentioned it. Um, yeah, so that that I'll have to just, I suppose, rewatch it just to kind of uh, understand that a little bit better. But uh, I think from from what I'm taking from all this is it, it's mostly about kind of like uh, like emotional investment and um, if 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 a reader kind of understands what's at stake, as as kind of Stu said. Um, that it'll have a bit more of an impact uh, in terms of, of, of the overall kind of fight scene. Um, so yeah, that's interesting points. Is this, would anyone else like to dive into that or move on? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll um, touch on that. So uh, I know you said like what makes a gripping fight sequence and like what do you do to build up to an epic showdown? So um, one of the things that I think about when building up to an epic showdown is making that promise to the reader that these two people or these two armies or whatever are going to fight at some point and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. I think especially like one of the, the fun like little tropes or little things that you can do is like, you know, showing these two individuals fighting other people and you're just like, wow, they're so good. And you know that eventually they're going to be fighting one another. Um, so I think like building up that anticipation for your epic showdown is always fun because, you know, once the reader gets to that page where they do have that epic showdown, it's very, very fun. Um, and I think definitely um, what people were saying about uh, having emotions in the scene, uh, having the stakes in the scene. Uh, one of the things that I think is uh, makes for a really good fight scene is having that dark moment where the protagonist uh, basically looks like everything is lost. <laughs> So they've come at this and it looks like everything is just down the drain and, you know, maybe they've lost their weapon or um, they've lost whatever magical powers they were using. Uh, I think that that really kind of ups the reader's investment in the fight. Um, it is one of those things, though, where when you put your protagonists into a really difficult position, you do have to figure out how to get them out of it. <laughs> So fortunately, as writers, we have more time to do that. So I think putting your protagonist in a really difficult position is a good way to keep the fight gripping. Yeah, yeah that's um, a really good point. I think, I think the point about building up to it is really important. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite movies is Once Upon a Time in the West, which is a Sergio Leone movie. And he, ha I've read something from him once where he was saying, I want to focus less on the actual violence itself, which is quite brief, and more on the, the build up to it. So there's this one duel that happens in the movie where you know the camera is swooping and the music is going and they're just standing there getting ready to fight and it's epic. And, um, and, and when you actually look at the whole movie, the whole movie is this build up to this duel between these two characters. And the violence itself is super, super brief. Like it's a couple of seconds of gunshots being exchanged but it still feels amazing and climactic. So, yeah, and the other thing, one, one of the other things I would say is uh, with regards to the stakes, like I see one, one of the mistakes I see a lot of people making is, oh, there's this big battle happening. We're just going to get involved in the big battle because there's a big battle happening. No, no, try, try, and, give your, um, <laughs> try and give your character a, a, a really personal motivation. And it doesn't always have to be the battle. Like, um, Maybe they're in the battle to make sure that somebody else doesn't get killed during it, but maybe they don't want to be in the battle and are trying to run away from it. Uh, or maybe they're taking advantage of the battle to run a completely unrelated heist. Like, whatever it is, give your character, like, a really personal motivation, which can lead them through the big battle se sequence. Absolutely, yeah. that's, that's a great point. Uh, and just as you were kind of you were saying that, I kind of uh, got reminded of a film I seen recently. Um, I think it's the Free State of Jones, starring uh, Matthew McConaughey. But kind of tying into what you're saying there, um, he's I, I think he fights for the, the Confederate Army, but he's got a son, and he, um, or his son got forcibly enlisted in, so he tries to get him to to basically the two of them want to flee. But uh, like what you said, there's this entire scene where he's basically 
like in the middle of an attack trying to get him to safety and so forth so and it really really does kind of uh, build to it so that's, that's definitely an excellent point um okay so uh there was actually i had another question now before i go into it i would like to remind everyone at home and um, that if you are watching this and you do have any questions for about anything that we've talked about or for any of our fantastically skilled uh warrior authors here do put them in the comments and we will try and get to them at the very end. Um, so yeah, there was actually, it's based on a, on something that we were chatting about, uh, Susanna, uh, just in terms of um, what, what's the difference between writing uh, large scale battles, uh, which I think you point out the focus is more on the likes of tactics uh, compared to the likes of a one-on-one -on -one duel um, between uh, two distinct characters. So maybe you'd like to kind of take the point on that and uh, then whoever else would like to get involved, please feel free to dive in. Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things is do you get your um, overall military tactics right? Um, I'll, I'll just give a book recommendation. John France's uh, Western Warfare in the Age of the Crusades is an academic work. Uh, it goes over things like uh, castles, um, the way the society's econom economic, economic structure um, affected how they made war, um, uh, battles and how they were fought, the weapons and just how the whole social structure influenced the way the society made war. So there'll be something out there for whatever you've, you've based your midi, uh, your fantasy world on and, and you'll be able to, to find it. And yeah, um, I, think, I think one of my best tips for writing um, battle scenes, major battle scenes, as opposed to one-on-one -on -one duels is I like to work in multiple point of views because um, when you're writing a battle, you want a big battle, you want to give a sense of the epic scale. And so I like to put a point of view character in a few different places in the battle. Um, so like one character might be stuck in the vanguard during an ambush while another character is leading a charge from the rear to relieve them, like that, that happens in one of my books. Or um, another character might be viewing the battle from an elevated command post while another one is caught in the thick of it. Um, I've written one battle scene where I even added little flashbacks to the strategy meeting when the generals are planning the battle. So just as many point of views as you can incorporate to give an idea of the scale and what's happening in different places, and you can actually interleave them quite quickly in s short scene snippets to give a sense of pace. Um, that's somewhat I like to do. And then, and then you can just pull back and focus on the reactions of each character and the personal quest of each character, which gives it that personal grounding. So that's my technique. Yeah, very interesting. And um, would anyone else like to weigh in on that? Uh, any thoughts on that? Um, Angela or Stu or Andrea? Michael? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. say something. I, cause I, um, my, the two books that are out right now are both first person point of view. Cool. And so um, I haven't written any really large scale wars yet, but I do have a few battle scenes. And with the first person point of view, it's a little difficult because, you know, you can't like pan out really. You're like just right there. But I don't think that I don't I think that you can make that battle seem like big and epic and immediate, even just focusing on that one person's experience of it, because uh, you know, there's lots of big things happening. There's like, you know, it's terrifying, right? There's cannons going off. There's things happening, this, you know, like magic because, you know, I had to throw that in, but it's, you know, it's like things exploding and, 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 and things like that. And it, and it's all kind of hitting her, my, my main character, like all at once. And so I think you get, I, I hope that you get kind of the feeling of, what it's like, you know, more down on the ground to that one person. And then you Fog can experience it yeah. through that. And so, you know, you might not have the idea that, that like, oh, like, you know, it's not like a risk board. You're not like playing a game where you're moving all the armies in and stuff like that. It's just like, this is that one experience of what's going on. And then like in the sequel, I hope to, um, I'm, you know, I'll go back and you'll get some other perspectives on it. So you can kind of, as a retrospective, see more of what it, what effects it had and what happened, you know, and stuff like that after the fact, but. 
Yeah, that's it's really good. It's, it's some really good kind of points there, and I think uh, one of the things that kind of um, I suppose uh, struck me is just in terms of like like what you were saying uh, about point of view, which is actually leads into our next question. So we'll go into that in a moment. But um, something that I, I suppose always stays with me is like growing up watching a war film or say like a, a fight sequence. Um, but I'll tell you what, we just use the analogy of a, of a war film or a battle scene. Um, how in my head, it was always just like we have side A on this side versus side B and they just run at each other or, you know, they have their swords or they're just shooting at each other or whatever. And that was it. And it was just it was more kind of like um, firepower wins. Well, I never understood and kind of, I suppose, only learned thanks to my uh, my uh, military training with the Reserve Defence Forces was the likes of kind of strategy. So it's now I'm kind of looking at it. I suppose a war film or reading a war book and I'm kind of seeing it because of it, I basically lived through it. So it's uh, it's it's interesting how little details like that can uh, make a big impact. Um, but yeah, I'm going to kind of go with what you were ta- chatting about there, um, Angela, uh, and that's the point of view. So it's, it's kind of like what, like what can you do with the different um, points of view in a book? Um, like, is there any kind of pros or cons to using different points of view? Uh, and the best example I, I can use is um, for Big Red, which was my debut. Uh, that's all written in first person. So the likes of the combat scenes tend to be smallish because um, it's based around um, normally kind of section level, which is about nine people. Uh, and even in the big kind of combat scenes, he's only looking at it from his kind of perspective. But with the likes of Blood Red Sand, I kind of moved it to third point, third person. And that way got to get like a, a bit of a back and forth style of, of the, the battlefield and look at it from the enemy perspective and the allied perspective and so forth. So I'd be curious, uh, has anyone any thoughts on, on points of view and what it can do to add to or detract from uh, writing a fight scene or a battle scene? I think so I'll jump in. I think Susanna kind of had it uh, with the idea of uh, kind of, particularly if you're wanting to get across the scale and make sense of it, uh, it, it, it can be very effective to use multiple points of view. Yeah. And uh, I was talking with uh, RJ Barker about this uh, and we were talking about, so in his, uh, in his Wounded Kingdom trilogy, he switches from uh, kind of close third person into present tense when he moves into fight scenes. Oh, right. Really? And so it really, and people don't notice it because it's really, it's handled really well. But if you go and check, you'll yeah. notice that any action scene is written in the present tense. That's uh, uh, and, interesting. And, it's and, it, and yeah. so it was a really nice sleight of hand that he used there. But I think there are all sorts of little tricks you can use to kind of deliver the, the kind of the atmosphere that you're trying to deliver. Right. Yeah. I think, I think, Susanna, I think, was it you who uh, kind of said fog of war just a few minutes ago? Um, yeah. There's that that's that's a really real thing. Having having been in actual fights because I'm brown and other people were white and didn't like the colour of my skin, trust me, there's the, the, there's this narrowing of the vision and all of a sudden there's nothing out there except what's going on directly to you. And I think that first person is really great for capturing that, right? That sense of my world is closed down to what's right before me and what I'm gonna do about it, or or not, as the case may be, right? But the, I think I think point of view is an old is a, for me is a thorny one right the story will kind of tell you what point of view you need to you know if you trust yourself the story will kind of go this needs to be in first person or this needs to be in third and it will or, or whatever it might be and you'll kind of get there you just have to try to trust your gut in what you're trying to say yeah that's that's definitely interesting um i mean it's it's fascinating what you said about the rj switching up the um the likes of the the point of views i think the the only thing i've um seen that in recently was the court of broken knives and i think that's by uh anna smith i think is it i could be wrong on that but that's anna smith's mark and i thought that was really really interesting how she you know depending on the character and how they were telling the story how it completely changed and it was just a very kind of unique way of doing it so it's definitely interesting to to see uh, or do that i'll have to definitely take a closer look at some of the stuff um does anyone else have any thoughts on points of view or um i cheated a little on mine because i like both oh, yeah. third and first <laughs> so <laughs> i've got like two first person point of views and uh three third persons which um makes for uh, I think I get to do both in a big battle scene have that very close like immediacy but also get to see what everybody else is doing so that was kind of fun that's good yeah well look um kind of like what you said uh you kind of I suppose listen to what point of view the story is telling you and if it feels natural and, and it reads right go with it you know so uh yeah that's that's brilliant so we'll move on to the next question and this one is about uh technology so uh when I, I say technology I don't necessarily mean uh, a giant death star it could be in terms of like um some super powerful wizard capable of destroying an entire army with a spell but um 
where do you as writers kind of see technology uh, in your in in your writing and in the likes of writing a fight scene? And um, so the likes of Susanna, you'd be writing about kind of the like Crusader type of stuff um, uh, and all the weaponry they'd use during a siege. Um, or we could be talking about uh, the likes of uh, Angela. You mentioned kind of having m- magic in uh, your kind of books. So do you as writers believe that? Um, it adds to it. It takes away from it. The readers want to see more kind of magical spell battles. Do they want to see kind of more super powerful world destroying lasers? Or how do you as a, as a writer kind of add it in there that it doesn't kind of, I suppose, go into overkill? And that's open to anybody who would like to dive in there first. Well, oh, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> I just think, I think it, you know, it depends on the book and how you set it up. Like if you're going to, it goes back to the, if, if you have something that's going to be important, then you have to start setting it up to be important, you know, yeah. like at the beginning. And I often do that in revisions, actually. I write and then I kind of figure it out as I go along. And then after I have a whole draft, then I know it's important. And so I'll go back and I'll try to layer that in. But, but if, if you're writing a, book like like mine it has swords and guns and the and it starts off like the city's been decimated you know in this war and it's after the war but if you're going to have certain technology around and I think the readers are going to expect you to use it you know if you make it sound like a big deal it probably ought to be a big deal at some point in the book or it's going to be kind of disappointing you know um on the level of a reader um so I, I think it's a, it's kind of a line though, you, you know, like you don't want to be overpowered and that's where consequences come in. Like you have to have, you don't want to make it too easy on your, on your protagonist. You got to make it hard on your protagonist and stuff. But, but, you know, there are always things that can go wrong with everything. So that's kind of the way I think of it, I guess. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, what about yourself, Michael, for, for someone who's kind of armed with a spear there? What, what are your thoughts yeah. on kind of weaponry? <laughs> um, just speaking a bit uh, more generally, um, I think whenever you introduce um, an element like technology or magic into a fight scenario, <clears throat> um, I think you have to establish early on in the story what the rules are regarding these new wrinkles, be it laser blasters, lightsabers, or magic spells. You have to you have to establish the rules and reinforce them throughout the story and honor them to the very end. Because if you if you tell the reader these are the conditions X, Y, and Z, and then you completely betray those conditions because you've written yourself in the corner or you're trying to pull off a dramatic twist, you're, you're betraying the reader and they're going to call you on that. Um, yeah. If you, if you tell, if you tell your readers early on, if you're writing a fantasy and you say, this is how magic works. You need, you need a magic wand in which to channel your magic, you know, a Harry Potter style thing. And you reinforce that all throughout the story. And then your protagonist gets to a point where his wand breaks and he no longer has it, but then he's able to work magic anyways, because he's the chosen one or he's got this heretofore unknown power. That's not a shocking plot twist. That's a lazy writer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. I am. I would I'd agree and I would add like one of the things I, I love about Star Wars is that they have these cool swords and telekinetic powers but then George Lucas like hired Errol Flynn's old fencing choreographer for the <laughs> fight scenes so <laughs> so he kept it grounded in a certain way in the real world but for me like one of the one of the questions raised by the whole question of um, you know the giant weaponry and the fantastical elements is um it becomes more of a question of larger scale devastation, um, which can sometimes, doesn't have to, but can sometimes overwhelm the sense of personal stakes that you're wanting to go for. So I'm like, one of my favorite examples is the Empire Strikes Back versus A New Hope. Like A New Hope, what are the stakes? The stakes is the giant laser about to destroy the entire rebellion. And it's not really a really personal or compelling stake for me anyway. And the more compelling stake is in The Empire Strikes Back when it's it's pretty much just Luke's soul that's at stake. Like, is is he going to be turned to the dark side? 
And it feels like higher stakes to me because it feels more personal because um, I, as the audience, care more about what's going to happen to him. And so I think that even when you do have the fate of like galaxies and cities and planets at stake and giant destructive weapons or giant destructive spells, um, the more personal you can make the stakes and the impact on the characters, the better that's. Yeah, some, some very interesting points. I think, yeah, that's that's a really interesting what you said in terms of uh, Star Wars. Because, um, yeah, I think, I think you, you know, at the end of... Um, you know the the likes of a, a new hope um you do see this massive kind of like weapon but empire strikes back it is specifically about the character and because you're so kind of invested in in, in him like yeah uh, like that and will always kind of stand out in my mind as just one of those you know very kind of uh, powerful ones so yeah that's that's interesting does anyone else want, want to dive into this point or no i think just very briefly for me i love that st- i love magic and i love big explosions and space lasers and a lot of it but they have to make sense in the, in the context. Uh, and so I want to understand, look, if you've got a society that's producing space lasers or you've got a society full of mages, what does that society look like? What, where does it lead, right? So good, good epic fantasy, you, you understand how those societies function. So in doing research on, on the Crusades or on medieval uh, Italy, whatever, there's, there's a whole sense of how the economy works and how people come together and how, how they make war as, as a result of that. And I kind of want to have a sense of that as a reader when I'm seeing magic on the page. It doesn't have to, I don't want to know how someone necessarily makes blue, blue dye or anything like that. It doesn't have to be super detailed, but I want to, I want to have a sense that it makes sense for the people involved that these things are going on and, and that over the course of their history, they've adapted to these strange things that we don't have interesting points there too and kind of what you're saying about the world uh, I think kind of ties in a little bit what, what Susanna said earlier on um, and I can't for the life of me think of it but there, there's a book out there and I read it before but it, it studies like um, I think it's the history and economies of the major world powers and I guarantee you the name world powers is in the title somewhere I just can't think of it but it, it looks at the likes of um, the ancient kingdoms of, of like um, Sweden, Russia uh, I don't think there was even like anything remotely like a UK at the time um, it was like around the time of like uh, France forming up as a king them and um, it was it took these three or four different kind of countries studied their economies looked at how they kind of grew and um, how to use warfare to kind of shape their their policy and then collapsed because of you know um different kind of internal and external pressures and then it looked at the next kind of generation of countries and works its whole way up to the likes of um the cold war between america and uh and the ussr so um and it was just really fascinating how it kind of it tied into you know like i said how the kind of economies work how the different kind of systems work uh, and how external and internal pressures can kind of like yeah uh, i suppose drive uh, a society and um drive the innovation and the weaponry behind um what they use for for the likes of warfare so um i'm raging i can't even think of the name of that book but yeah if you ever see something about world powers and it's it's up until the 1980s that's it check it out um but yeah so in terms of questions i think that's pretty much us covered uh unless anyone here would like to uh dive into Anton specifically I was going to have a quick look at the comments so was there anything of interest between us as writers based on what someone else said or Anton you'd like to expand on before we have a look at the comments happy out grand job um so let's have a quick look and see who we are so looks like we have a few people uh viewing so Katie Tree said nice spear so there you go Michael and um, you're the man of the arrow which are your your spear uh, and hello to Diane Wolf that's my publisher and she was on a few panels earlier on Power Watcher 2 says looking forward to learning about fight scenes and I really hope that you learn more if you have any questions about anything we said do let us know uh Fiddles T Brigand which is the greatest name I've ever <laughs> heard <laughs> says oi oi I'm very few tv characters look like a raccoon for the rest of the show and i no clue what that's in reference to. it's probably something we said earlier on and i don't have a clue katie tree says some brilliant uh, tips there uh power watcher 2 asks any advice about modern realistic guns and rifles in fiction so uh would anyone kind of want to weigh into that um who maybe kind of writes a bit more modern kind of weaponry um what can you do in terms of realism uh what can you do to add to a scene how do you kind of wield them any tactics to to kind of discuss on that I'd be I'd be happy to I suppose take that one since I'm kind of more uh, focused on the futuristic and, and kind of modern stuff. So um, just to answer that, yeah, I, I was trained with a semi-automatic assault uh, rifle called the Steuer, um, and I'd never kind of held a weapon before. Um, obviously, Ireland, uh, we wouldn't have kind of like uh, 
any type of uh, you can't kind of carry your own weapon without um, special licenses and nine times out of ten that's just farmers for kind of protecting their their kind of property and their and their sheep and so forth and um, so would have never held or had any type of an experience before he enlisted in the reserve defense forces one of the things that kind of struck me um, and something you probably don't see as much in, in movies is the emphasis on safety training. So um, I would have watched war movies where you have all soldiers kind of like, you know, marching around or in a uniform and they're all kind of like on the firing range. But I, of course, I suppose they can't really expand too much in the hours and hours and hours of safety drills that they do, uh, which yeah, and how to kind of maintain a weapon and how to look after a weapon and so forth. So um, I think it was months before I actually fired anything uh, i had to learn how to take it apart and put it back together with my eyes closed i had to learn how to use it um regardless of environment so um say like if the weather's warm or you're in a tropical condition or if you're in the middle of antarctica or whatever you have to know how to maintain and look after a weapon uh, in terms of you know protecting it from the from the elements um and then i suppose there, there's the countless hours that goes into the theory behind it how do you spot a target how do you kind of like measure distance to, to hit a target accurately and um, what do you do for gun jams um, and that sort of stuff so just um for for tips when it comes to um weaponry uh, in in modern fiction i definitely recommend kind of do your research uh, have a look at youtube it's it is a fantastic um resource for writers looking to get in instructionals or get deeper insights into um the likes of you know different weapons and i think we've all done it at one stage or another to to look at certain kind of uh, martial arts or whatever or to try and really enhance a fight sequence and um, there is lots of books out there um if it's if you if it's case that you're looking to, I, I suppose explore modern kind of warfare. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Band of, Band of Brothers, um, which is like a epic series um, set in World War II. Absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the the techniques and I suppose things that I would have learned. Um, actually stem from that and i think it's um e easy company i think they were called from the 101st airborne um i think was captain winters was one of the first to put in a, a successful uh, section and attack uh, and how we attacked that uh, german bunker at the end of episode one is pretty much what's taught um in militaries throughout the world today including myself i would have learned how to do exactly what he's what he's doing there so i thought that was really cool the first time i saw it. i was like i know how to do that i know exactly what he's doing look hell you know so yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. If you want to write modern war fiction, watch Bander Brothers. <laughs> That's my tip there. So, um, I'll just have a look and see if there's any more um, questions there. Um, yeah, so K3 uh, hopped in there. Yes, yeah, so The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, that's the novel, or, or that's the book that I was trying to remember there. Um, so, yeah, I do recommend anyone who kind of want to look into um, the likes of worlds and, and I suppose mm. how... I think warfare is, you know, you need some sort of an economy in order to, to, to kind of launch it, you know, uh, and maybe something to kind of, kind of consider when it comes to medieval type of settings. Um, you can't wage a war without cold, you know. Actually, go on, Susanna. Oh, yeah. I, I, th I thought uh, people might be interested in, so um, <clears throat> the kind of the kind of war you wage is, is very much based on the kind of economy you have, like in um, Northern Europe during the, my period, um, they had a land-based economy. So if you wanted to build wealth and build power, you had you had to have more land because trade wasn't such a huge thing. And so that led to constant small-scale raiding and petty warfare between land-owning um, powers, whereas down in the Italian trading states, which is more like the kind of thing that Angela writes based on, um, they had a trade-based economy because they were on the Mediterranean and they could go around it. And so um, they're because they had the trade-based economy, their war looked much more like naval war and wars of colonization in different areas rather than wars between the people who were actually living in the um, medieval trading cities. So, you know, all, all those things are considerations. Yeah, it's interesting. It really is. And it's something I, I would have taken for granted um, even a, a couple of years ago. Like I just, you know, thought that the king summoned his men and they all just got together and that's it. They went to war. But I suppose when you look at it, like there's so many logistical things, like um, even if you have some sort of a feudal society where I suppose like in, in Game of Thrones, where, you know, they call the banners and, you know, everyone comes flocking from the farms to join up. You still need to well, you pay for uniforms. They come you know? flocking from the farms, <laughs> yeah. but they don't necessarily have yeah. to. And you, it's hard to make them. And so like you could throw a war and nobody might turn up <laughs> <laughs> yeah or, or, or you could look at henry the eighth and, and say that that's a man whose reign was 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 can be summarized as a man who wanted to go to war but his chancellors wouldn't let him because he couldn't afford it 
exactly, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's 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 mad, you know. I suppose when you look at the, the, all these different scenarios and kind of wonder what would have happened or what would have turned out differently if like um, people didn't have the resources that they had. So I suppose what you're saying, Suzanne, about the, the trade based economy versus the land based economy, you know, uh, and it's really interesting to see how kind of like kind of, kind of countries uh, or in different states kind of evolved and, and kind of grew. And um, you take the likes of the, the Roman Empire, um, obviously based in the Mediterranean, with a lot of these, you know within kind of striking distance of a lot of these other kind of communities and states and how it kind of grew from there to expand, I think, was it something like one in five citizens at its height were, uh, were a Roman citizen throughout the entire world. Um, so I'm saying that wrong. 20% of the world's population at the time were Roman citizens, which is um, absolutely crazy kind of an achievement, you know, um, and something I personally wouldn't mind exploring a little bit more. Um, I suppose the economic side of stuff so uh, yeah just something to I suppose consider uh, I'll have a look uh, and see if there's any other comments so um, so let's see so yeah um, Fiddles T Brigand says getting punched in the nose um, so yeah does anyone have an experience of getting punched in the nose and how would that influence how uh, you're writing? I mean, the post I came, I got a steel toe cap boot to the to the face um, when I was younger, but never the nose. So um, I'll have to skip that question. If anyone else would like to weigh in there, uh, it hurts a lot. <laughs> um, it was it was ironically in a in a stage combat situation, uh, so he shouldn't have made contact. But uh, fight partner threw a jab, just barely caught me on the nose. And even just getting tapped was, I mean, the first thing it did is it briefly short circuited my entire nervous system. I had this moment of my entire body going, oh my God, what just happened to me? Um, the pain hit a second or two later and it, it, it was simultaneously felt like forever until the pain hit and an instant later. But then there was that wave of pain just going all over my face my eyes started watering. My sinuses immediately got kind of clogged up. No, there was no blood. He didn't break anything, thank God. And But again, that was just a tap on the bridge of my nose. And if that had been a real fight, that would have been enough for him to just lay into me good after that. So taking a full fist to the nose... Yeah, if you're high on adrenaline, maybe you could shrug it off. Um, I mean, there's I've seen, I've seen, I've seen women soccer players who take a ball to the face, start gushing blood, but they just keep on going. But that's the that's what you call the exception, not the rule. So I think it depends. Having fighting a fighting kind of a lot <laughs> as a person for, for, for martial arts. I, uh, and I would say that there's a difference. So if you're caught unawares, that experience is common to all of us. I've been punched in the face unawares or stabbed in the face unawares uh, whilst wearing fencing gear, not actually with sharp knives, um, <laughs> just with just with steel swords. But uh, nevertheless, but, but it, catching you unawares is absolutely going to... Your phrase of short-circuiting your nervous system, is it's just going to stun you. You'll probably forget how to breathe for a moment because your whole brain is going, what just happened? And then it will switch on and the adrenaline will hit. But if you're in the zone and you are kind of in, in, in kind of sword fighting, we call it arousal. And that comes from, comes from the medieval texts, which talk about, are you at the right arousal level? If you've got that adrenaline flowing, you're ready for it. Actually, you can, you can walk it through. Uh, unless it's a blow that's actually going to do you serious damage. Most of the time you just kind of do that. You may let out a, a kind of a verbal ow, but, but most of the time you will, you will continue going. And it will be about the force of the blow and how deadly it is that does something to stop you. There are there are extant manuals uh, and, and accounts that talk of people who've been stabbed through the neck, through the heart, who go on to kill their opponents before they die. So adrenaline will take you a long way. Uh, and uh, even when you're actually dead, your body won't know it because you, you've you've still got a few moments. And in, and in when we fight, we we encourage our fences. Uh, we have a thing called the afterblow rule. Most international tournaments have them, which is you need to get in and make a clean strike and then get out without being hit. Because the idea is to simulate the sense that you you haven't been stabbed to death by the person you've just killed. Because that is that is something that we read about quite a lot. It's interesting. Yeah. 
good stuff. So um, I'm worried that uh, we're nearly at the end of the con. We have uh, five minutes left, uh, and I think we've time for just about one more question. So uh, Serena um, asks, funny fight scenes are the best. What are some of your favorites? So can anyone think of a funny fight scene, whether it was you just thought it was absolutely hilarious and how it was executed, where you just thought it was terrible? Um, it could be a funny fight scene from your... A book or maybe a work that got scrapped or anything can anyone think of anything funny a funny fight scene um, Danny Kay and the court jester sorry what's that Danny Kay and the court jester what's uh, it, like it. okay if you have it if you've not seen it it's it's as the title suggests Danny Kay playing a court jester but there's a bit in there where he's basically been hypnotized to think that when he's in a trance he is the world's greatest sword fighter but throughout this particular sequence, he's going in and out of being this brilliant sword fighter and a complete cowardly klutz. And he's against oh, yeah. Basil Rathbone, who's super straight man in this. Um, and it's it's a great sequence. It's I mean, it's Danny Kay, so you're you're off to a winning start right there. But the way he goes back and forth between I'm Errol Flynn and oh my god, I'm Danny Kay. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. There you go. I'll have to check that out. Uh, anyone else have any funny fight scenes? I, I mean, the only thing I keep thinking is just like bits and pieces from The Simpsons, you know? Um, but I don't think that's really uh, worth much in this one. Uh, I'll just see if there's any more questions because I know... Uh, sorry about that, Serena. I genuinely can't think of a single funny fight scene to comment on or reference. And I guarantee as soon as I finish this call, uh, I'll think of about 10. Uh, have you got something, Stu? <laughs> just just because they, I love slapstick and the films themselves have aged terribly and are full of, <laughs> kind of tropes that are not good right they're, they're not good in any way but the fight scenes in the peter sellers inspector cluso films oh, between yes. him and his manservant oh, are they are they're just pure they're pure lyrical cinema the, the relationship and and the films themselves are very, like as i say they age badly but those elements i think are, are very very cleverly done well then there's jackie chan's of like Yes. City Hunter yeah, yeah. or like in, anything with him. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't seen um, the Inspector Clouseau films in years. Um, so yeah, I'll have to kind of rewatch them. And in terms of like the Jackie Chan stuff, I, I can't remember what film it was. But where's the one he went over to America? Um, and I think he was pretending to be the the, the Native American. Uh, and I think was it Chris Rock was the or was it Chris Rock? No, you, I think you're you're getting Shanghai noon ah, and, that's, uh, yeah. rush hour kind of confused. That's it, yeah. I'm losing so it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, it just goes to show I, I, like, I don't get uh, much time to kind of watch films uh, that much. I'll have to kind of just uh, have a look into them. Uh, I'll just have a look for um, any more questions here now. Um, yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy. There we go from from Serena. Yeah, fair play. That's I should have led with that. Um, okay. Well, look, I don't think we don't seem to have any more questions there now at the minute. Um, yeah. So thank you, Quarren Con. It's Shanghai noon and rush hour. So thanks again for calling me out on that. I got it wrong. Um, <laughs> I we only have two minutes left, so uh, I think maybe we should do another quick kind of like. Uh, I saw a closing up scene. So maybe if everyone would like to go around uh, the table, um, if there's anything you'd like to discuss, if you have a project coming up, if you have a piece of work coming out, if you've got a, a guest article, podcast, if you've got another live show coming out. So let's go around the table. Anything you'd like to talk about, try and keep it to about 30 seconds, just about yourself or about your work or something you'd like to celebrate with everybody. Um, so yeah, Michael, we'll start with you. Have you got any news for us? Or oh, I'm just... Focus? I'm just plugging away, taking advantage of the fact that I'm home most of the time. Uh, I've got a lot of ongoing projects. If people want to follow me, the best place to start is my website, which is insmithlook.com. If you're a Lovecraft fan, you'll get the reference. Go there. You can learn everything about me and my writing and choose which social media platforms to follow me on or completely ignore me on. Brilliant. Okay. And uh, Susanna, if you want to go next, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about any projects you got coming up or something to call out. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm writing, uh, at, at present I'm taking a little bit of a break from the Crusade history books to write a gaslight, a gas lamp fantasy set in 1890s, in a 1990s Europe, which is ruled by monsters. Cool. It's called Miss Sharp's Monsters. You can find out about that on my website, susannaroundtree.site. 
and you can get a couple of free novellas um, for signing up to my mailing list. So go and check that out. Yeah, check that out, everyone. Uh, Angela, if you'd like to hop in there. Um, yeah, right now I'm working on uh, kind of two books, like alternating. I've got the first book in a new series that's going to come out later this year. It's called um, Through Dreams So Dark, and this one's a Portal Fantasy, um, which is kind of a Cold War espionage, but epic fantasy too. Um, and I'm working on the second book in the Atarian Empire series. It's going to be Fool's Promise, and it's taken a little bit longer, but that that should be out soon. So, oh, brilliant, fair play. And Stu, we'll do you next. Anton uh, so I can't. I'm on, under NDA on the stuff that I'm actually uh, fiction-wise at the moment, Fancy. so I can't talk about it. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> In terms of non-fiction, I'm writing quite a lot of criticism at the moment. Uh, so you you can find um, uh, my uh, weekly reviews of stuff like uh, Them, the new horror anthology on Amazon Prime, Falcon and the Winter Soldier and stuff on uh, Sci-Fi Bulletin. And I'm just about to guest edit uh, an issue of Vector uh, for the, uh, the British Fantasy and Science Brilliant. Fiction Association. And that will, uh, it's an open call for, it's an academic journal, open call for papers on this, uh, idea of justice in a, uh, science fiction and fantasy. That's really cool. Fair play to you. I look forward to reading more about that. And Andrea, any good news to shout out or any anything you'd like to tell everyone about? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I'm just working on the third book for uh, the Drowning Empire trilogy. Um, but my first one, uh, Bone Shard Daughter, is the speculative fiction pick of the month for Burns and Noble. So I'm very excited about that. Well, so well done. You go. If you go into a Barnes and Noble, it'll be like on one of their front tables uh, with a little sign and everything. So, um, yeah, so I'm pretty thrilled about that. Well done. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. And uh, I suppose the only thing to, to kind of mention for myself is my second novel in the series, Blood Red Sand. If you ever wanted to uh, or if you ever wondered um, what it would look like between uh, Allied soldiers and uh, fighting against Nazis on Mars, uh, check that out. So and that's the second book in the Red series. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been called, uh, I think my favourite quote about my writing style was uh, from um, an American author uh, who, who was kind of uh, a part of my publishing company as well. And he called it Bat Crap Crazy. And I just thought that's brilliant. I, I kind of want to get a t-shirt of that made, you know. Um, so it's one of my writing goals to be called Bat Crap Crazy. Uh, and I think that's the play version. But um, yeah, <laughs> first off, I do want to say thank you very much for everyone for contributing tonight. Uh, I think we've, we've covered a lot of points. Personally speaking, I'd love to kind of keep this panel going on for another hour, hour and a half. Um, I'm just uh, afraid that the organisers are um, uh, glaring at me from behind the screen. So I have uh, my good friend, P.S. Livingston, uh, Pam. I can actually feel her staring at the monitor right now. Um, so I better wrap up. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been fantastic. Hopefully we'll all get together again soon. Um, QuarantCon uh, will hopefully take place in some format uh, next year. Um, to everyone watching, do kind of uh, keep an eye out on social media. We still have a new few, a few more days for it. Uh, check out the artist Ali and check out some book deals. And we have a cosplay competition and short story competition. Competition. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. We've, it's been a blast. So cheers. Thanks, everyone. And you're off YouTube and I'm just